like with all other programming languages, Python also has a if statement. So in Python, you can have if statements to in Python. You can have loops in Python, and then we have functions in Python. In Python, an if statement or a conditional statement are statements used to make decisions based on certain conditions. It is very important to realize that we only make a decision if a particular condition is met. For example, if I have the statement that looks like this, if condition, then I will do the statement that is here. The condition here, it's very important for us to realize is an, it is a, 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 an expression that we evaluate to either give us a true or a false as an answer. That means that if I have a particular um, expression and I evaluate that expression and I, I do not get a true or false as an answer, I cannot use that to express my condition. My condition can only be used or expressed using the um, true or false mantra. We can also have, that is, I will only do this. I will evaluate this. It will give me either true or false. And whatever answer I get, I'll go and do this. Or I will evaluate this and either do this. Or I'll come and do the statement that is here. So over here, I would open a Python code. I'll call it condition.py. And then in here, I'll put in this expression over here. Now, this expression goes to say, this expression goes to say, um, let me make it bigger so that it is seeable. Over here, I have number 10, okay? So the expression here, and a number is equal to 10. The expression here, it means that in here, I have 10. It's 10 bigger than zero. It is, I'll, I'll display a positive number. Is 10 smaller than zero? In here, I'll display a negative number. Else, I'm putting in zero. So if I run this, since 10 is bigger than zero, I am getting a positive number over here. Now, if n is smaller than zero, then I will get a negative number showing for me. So for example, if n is negative 10, then it means I'm getting a negative number. Why didn't the code run here? Why did it come and run here? Because the expression here would evaluate. Is negative 10 bigger than zero? The answer is no. So this expression will evaluate to what? False. Over here, is negative 10 bigger than zero? Yes, it is. So this evaluation evaluates into true. So everything in which I was saying was that the condition here we would express it using relational operators. And then when we write the code, we would write it so that if a particular condition is met, if a particular set of scenarios are met, if the particular set of scenarios are met and they are true, then I will enter into this section here and then express the code I have over there. Another thing to note, unlike the other programming languages, Python does not have curly brackets. So it uses indentation to show that 
you have entered the body of a particular expression. Hence, do not just create spaces for, for spaces sake. Note that each space you create, it is very, it, there is um, an importance to it when it comes to Python. So let's see another expression in our code. Let's see another program. So this program here is to determine if a number is positive or negative. So I can use this to determine if a phone number is positive or negative. I can write another program. Let's say number is equal to 15. Now, if the number modulo two is equal to zero, then print even number. Else, print odd number. So this program here will allow me to evaluate my expression and determine if a number is even or odd. For example, if I run this application here, I'll tell me that the number is odd, of course 15 is odd. But if I change this to 10, then it will tell me that it is what? Even. Again, this expression will be evaluated. Here, modulus is there for reminder. So what is the reminder if 10 is here? What is the reminder if you divide 10 by two? The answer is zero. Hence, you'd enter here. So this entire expression will express and give you a word, a true. Now, on the other way around, where I had 15, if I write this expression here, here would be 15. 15 modulus two would give you one. That means this expression here would evaluate to give you a false. If this is a false, then it means over here would be the code that would run and give you a true. So that is how you use, or that is how we express values using um, the if statement. And here we have the if what will happen, and if it is not so, if it is false, then we have a fallback to fall back on and then rely on that. Also, indentation is essential in Python. Each code under an if statement is indented to show that this code is a block under the, the if statement. Hence, this is how we used to show body or the code is under it, or it belongs to this half of the code. So again, don't just leave indentation in your code when it comes to Python. It's not like C++ where you have curly brackets to show the body. It's Python, there are no curly brackets to show any body. What is a loop? What is a loop? Now, a loop allows you to repeat a particular code over and over and over again. If I have code that I want to do again, if I have a scenario, if I have a piece of, uh, if I have an action, if I have something I want to do, that has to be done again and again and again, then I would use a loop. In Python, we have the for loop, we have the while loop. Loops, as I said, allow you to repeat a block of code multiple times. Python provides two main types of loops. We have the for loop and we have the while loop. So in Python, we have two main kinds of loops. We have the for loop, we have the while loop. Let us see an example of the for loop. So if I want to write code using the for loop, I would write my for keyword, I would write the item that I want to sequence. And then in here, I'll write the sequence I want to go in through. Let's see how we would uh, 
write a piece of code using the for loop. Let's see. Normally, remember, I would use the for loop when I know my starting point and I also know my ending point. When I know how I want to, when I want to start, And then when I want to end, then I would use a for loop. Then I would utilize a for loop. So let's utilize the for loop. In here, I have a particular sequence I want to run. For example, here I have a list of exam scores, okay? A list of exam scores. And I want to move through these exam scores. So I want to go through 35, 90, 78, 92, 88. I want to move through them. Oh, before we do that, this is a bit more um, difficult. So let's do something easy first. Let's take fruit. So I have fruits here, and I want to display my fruits. So here I would say four. Each fruit in fruits. Okay do the following, that is print, fruit. Now, what does this mean? What does this say? Over here, I have a list of items. I've grouped all of them in an array. We will look at an array in the future, but for now, let's just know what the word is. It is a set of... Uh, 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 like items grouped together. So if I have a set of items which are of the same type and they are grouped together, then I call that an array. Now I have an array. I have items listed in my array in a string format. So I have apple, banana, and cherry. Now here I have fruit in fruit. This fruits here is coming from the list I created over here. So where is this word here coming from? This word here, where is it coming from? The fruit. I'm technically telling the computer, when you go into fruits, so I'm in fruits, each item you pick, so this is one item, this is another item, this is another item, treat it like, it is on its own. So here, when I enter here and I pick this apple, now apple becomes fruit. Then I'll go and pick banana. Then I'll go and pick cherry. So I am using the word fruit to, to signify a single item that I have picked in the group in which I have. So for each item I pick in the group, I am singling it out and giving it the name fruit. So what this piece of code will do, it is to go through my list, move from one item to the other to the next item, and when it gets to the end where there is nothing more to be gotten, then the program will stop. Let us note this again. If I run this code here, you would see I have apple, I have banana, I have cherry. So I am displaying the fruits one after the other. I am picking them. So it will go into the fruits. In this case, the fruits could be any word. It's just the word we gave the list. And then since each item in fruit is a fruit, I am picking each item one after the other, and I'm just displaying it over here. I can also use it with the word range. So for example, here I can write for I in range five print I. 
Now, when I run this, I'll see I have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 being printed out for me. Note that the range starts from 0 and ends at one number before the number in which you specified. So in this case, if I wanted to get to 5, then I'll put in here 6. Then it means when I run this program now, I'll get 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 as part of the item in which I found. The next form of loop is the while condition. Now, I would use this kind of loop if I do not have a definite idea of my starting point and my ending point. That is, if I want to do something over and over and over again, and I don't know when I will stop, then I would use a loop. So in here, I have this condition here. Again, the word condition comes here. That means that this will evaluate and either give me a false or a true. So it means that I will only enter into this section here if my item is false or true. I will not do it in any other way else. Let's see an example. Here, I'm going to say count is equal to 1. Now, while count is less than or equal to 5, semicolon, print into bracket count. Then I'm going to say count plus or is equal to count plus one. Remember, me writing count is equal to count plus one is the same as me writing count plus is equal to what? One. So instead of me writing all of this, I would remove it. And then rather, I would write this. Remember, they are the same thing. So I can say count plus equal to one, which means count is equal to count plus one, one. Now, again, the indentation shows that this print and this count are all under the while statement. The count in programming is what we call the counter. It is there to regulate the condition over here. Because if I don't bring this count, then my loop will never stop because every single time, Count will be equal to one. When the program starts, count is one. When it enters here and comes back, count will be one. But because of this counter here, it means that count can increase every time in which I enter the loop. Hence, it will get to a point whereby count will be greater than five and will stop. Let us see how this thing works. When I click here, I can see I have one, two, three, four, five being showed to me. That is initially count as one. Then it will enter here, print count, which would print me one. Then it will come here and increase the count by one. Once it does that, count is now two. So I'll go and check here. It's two less than five. Then I'll come and print out what? Two. Then I'll come and check here again to three. Then I'll check here, is three less than five? It is. So I'll come here, print out three. I'll do that till I get to five. Five is less than or equal to five. So I'll print that. Then I'll increase it to six. Is six less than or equal to five? No, it is not. Hence, this expression here has become false. Hence, I can't do this whole thing here anymore. So that is the while condition. I would only use that when I do not know my ending point for my loop. When I know the ending point for my loop, then I would not use the while statement. I would use the for statement because I have a definite dimension on how I want to use my loop. Another tool we are learning is the function, the word function. What is a function? Functions allow you to write a piece of code that you would utilize again. If there is a piece of code that I would use again and again and again and again, 
if there is a piece of code that there is a need for me to reuse the code, rehab the code in something in which I am doing, I would utilize a function. A function is a piece of code that is written to perform a specific task when called upon. So whenever I call upon the function, it will appear, perform the task in which it is supposed to perform, and then go away. Hence, I would utilize a function for that. Now, in Python, we define a function with the word DEF as a keyword followed by the function's name, parenthesis, and a colon. Inside the parenthesis, you can include the parameters. Let's see what we mean. Now, what I mean is if you want to create a function in Python, you have the keyword function, you have the name of the function, then in here you have your, um, your, your braces or your your parameters, I don't know what, what way to call it, or your brackets, if you want to call it that. And then you have the parameters in here. That is the variables you want to pass to it. Let us see this in this way. A function is a set of code we call upon to perform a specific task. But sometimes the task it needs to perform, it needs external help to perform that task. Now, if it needs help from the outside, we put that help in the parameters so that the computer can get the external help it needs to help the function to operate and do what it needs to do. So let's see an example. Here I have a function that would greet someone and say, hello world. Here I have defined the function. Here I have the DEF keyword. I have the this name of the function as greet, and I have my parameters. And in this case, I am not passing any information to the outside world. Okay. And to, from the outside world to the function. Okay, that's fine. Here, I just want to print out hello. That hello world. That means every time in which I call upon the function by writing the function name and the signature, which is by writing the signature of the function, which is the name and the parameters together from the signature, each time in which I call upon the function by writing the signature, it means that this will be what? Printed. Again, a function allows us to perform actions over and over again because it helps with code reuse. If there is an action in code that will do over and over again, I will always go and put it in a function. In programming, if there's something we call an action, if there's an action I want to perform, if there's something I want to do, then I am doing it with a function because a function is a set of code to perform a specific task. Hence, I am doing an action. So here, when I call on greet, the action which will be performed is what? Hello world. And you can see hello world appearing twice because I called on it what? Twice. Now, I can want to greet a person. So if I want to greet a person, then I must know the person's name. In this case, I will pass the name from the external world because the function doesn't know the name. The name of the person may change. In this case, it is Alice. I may change it to go and put, let's say, Tom over here. I may change it to go and put, let's say, Kelvin over here. If I do this, and I run the code, you'd realize I have hello Alice, hello Tom, hello Kelvin. So the function is to perform a specific task. The task in this case is just to say hello and the name of the person. That's the task. The task can be complex as you calculating some mathematics or whatever it is. That is not the, the ball of contention now. How will I write a function? I would need to use the keyword diff, the name of the function, the parameters, and if there's something I want to pass from the outside world, I'll put it here. That means every time I put in Alice here, it will be saved in name, and then name would be used to display what I want to display. Perfect. Now, there are certain times in which a particular function would want to um, return a value. 
That is, after the function does this task, it wants to save a value onto itself. It wants to maintain a value after it has done what it needs to do. So in a case like that, then I'll put in a return type. So here I have parameters A, B. So you can see that I have put 5, 3 here. That means the 5 goes to A and the 3 goes to B. A plus B, and that means that whenever I call on add, what is saved is the answer of A plus B. So I can say add is equal to result. And that makes sense because I'm saying when it is done doing what I called it to do, it will save something onto itself. So I can go and collect what it has worked, save. Remember, if you don't bring a return type here, you cannot save anything onto itself. Hence, you can't utilize it like that. So, okay. So now, when I run this code, you realize that what will be printed for me will be what? Eight. And that is the solution four, five plus one, three. And note, every time you call on this, it means that if you put your parameters, another one will be calculated, so on and so forth. So, let's see some examples. Let's write a program that will calculate if a number is a prime number or not a prime number. A prime number, as we know, is any number that is divisible by one and itself. Right? So, here I have diff is underscore prime. That is, I have just defined a function. And here, I've just created the parameters and put in a parameter called num. In here, I'm going to say if none underscore one is less than or equal to one, then we are going to return False. Now, what does this statement mean? If the person here puts in a number here, so let's say hypothetically you put in a zero or any other number like that, or negative four or five, you can't have a prime number that is less than one. So right there, we are blocking all of those people out. So if you put in zero, we will check if your number is equal to one or it is less than one. Then over here, you are not a prime number, so it's false. Now, in the case in which you are a prime number, so in I in the range of, so I'm using it with range, two comma int into bracket num raised to the power 0 0.5 plus 1. Plus 1. So this is the range I'm looking for. If num divided by that, then you will return true. Oh, sorry, false. Now, if that is the case, if everything goes right, nothing goes wrong, then you return 
true. So let's see. What have I done here? What have I done here? I'm saying that create a function. Now it means that every time in which I call upon, let's say I type in here is a function five. It will tell me if five is a prime number or five is not a prime number. Now, over here, I have range. The first two in the range is telling me what my starting point is. So it means I am starting from what? Two. Because I can't start from one because, I, uh, 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 you know, every number divided by one is, is that. So that one is taken care of. So I'm starting from two. Okay, that's fine. Now, this half of it is where I am stopping. So this is where I will stop. So it means I'm doing two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I get to whatever computation this will give me, and then I will work. Now, I need to find the square root of the number. So this here would give me the square root of the number. Whatever I get as the square root of the number, I would save it as an integer. After I have done that, I am going to add one to it so that I have exactly the middle of the number. Then I would run through it. So here to have, let's say, I'll have this, I'll have that. So I know my starting point, my ending point, and then I'll run through it. If at any point, the number here, I divide with the number that I have given, and it gives me a remainder of zero, then, that thing cannot be a prime number. So I would run through it. So all the numbers here give me no remainder of zero. Each time there is a re there will be remainders. And then I would say true over here. So now I know what my how to find my prime number. Let's combine it with some things in which we did last week, whereby I would say number is equal to input, but the input is going to be an integer. So integer input into bracket, enter a number, semicolon. Then if is prime into bracket the number the person entered, then print out number is a number is a prime number. Else, print out number is not a prime number. So here we can accept information from a particular user when we accept, not that the expression here will give us true or false, which goes in line with what we are saying, that the condition must evaluate to give us a true or a false. So if here is true, then we'll go here. If it's false, then we'll go here. So if I enter this and I press equal to, it tells me five is a what? Prime number. Okay. So we have one question down, I guess. I would send you the next video 
that would be us solving the questions that was given to you in class with regards to the law negotiation and the uh, Navy and then the Kataka narration. Thank you.